Well, hello, sports fans. It's Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. I'm in San Jose, California. You see Stuart Weir to my right, and he's in Oxford, England. Hello, Stuart. How are you? Hi. Well, it's got a bit cold here with us, but uh, otherwise it's all fine. So define cold. How cold is it? Um, well, because we do centigrade rather than Celsius yeah. rather than Fahrenheit. So it's... Uh, Prob well, it's certainly a good 10 to 15 degrees less than it was last week. Whoa, okay, okay. So, yeah, well. um, sitting out in the garden last week, but uh, wearing a sweater this week, that kind of thing. understand, understand. Yeah, I was, uh, you were asking me just before we got on, um, yesterday, drove down with my girlfriend from San Jose to Big Sur, which is about 300 miles along two-lane highway enjoying the seals along the way and various sea creatures and then uh, drove back up. But it was just nice to get out. I think, uh, you know, the U.S. is going back and forth on the coronavirus thing, as you know, and I guess European unions decided that U.S. citizens like Russians aren't going to be allowed into their member countries um, due to COVID. So that, that'll be exciting. So any of that thought about me coming over and seeing a track meet this fall, I think it's kind of shot the hell if they even have them. Um, let's start from the very top. Um, a American athlete that you know little about, uh, Dick Berkeley, died last week at the age of 72. I believe he had Parkinson's um, for a about 10 or 12 years. He was a real character. He was uh, an Olympian in 76 and 80 at the 5,000 meters, held the world record indoors at the mile, 354.9, back in 1978. And he did it at, a, uh, I believe it was in uh, Maryland. And I remember watching it on uh, ABC because ABC TV at the time would have weekly track meets they would show us you know highlights and stuff but what was interesting about Berkeley was that he almost didn't make it there he was lived in Buffalo New York and Buffalo has terrible snow so he missed the flights out of Buffalo got a last minute flight into DC arrived at the track nine minutes before his race warmed up for five minutes and ran his personal best mile 354.9 on a I believe it was a 160 uh, meter track, which is no mean feat because it's all turns. But uh, he um, he beat Steve Prefontaine back in 1975 at an indoor two mile. And his response afterwards was a little off color. They asked him what he thought about and he said he thought about sex during races and track and field news printed his response you should uh, people will just probably have to look it up because i don't want to uh, go any farther than that but he had a great sense of humor we did a, a tribute to him and a uh, whole group of top americans and some of the brits said really nice things about him he, he retired at the Weltklasse in 96 after winning the 5000 that day so that's kind of a cool way to go out Got to meet him a couple times. I liked him. He was a Coke executive for a while. And then his last 20 years of his life, he was a high school teacher, taught Spanish and coached cross country and track. So, you know, uh, he, uh, he was one of those guys from kind of one of our golden eras in American track and field. Uh, had been bald since he was 12 years old. And uh, which kind of, Guys would rub his head and give him trouble after races and stuff. But he was uh, he was a good guy. And, uh, you know, we'll keep his family and friends in our prayers. Mm. Um, next one was the one you sent me a little note about, Barry Fudge, who had worked with the late Neil Black. And what's your thoughts there, Stuart? Well, ne um, Barry Fudge was head of endurance at okay. British Athletics since December 2013. And he has now left his position. Right. Um, 
this is, is more fallout from the Salazar story, okay. really. Now, we have to, to say that uh, Fudge has not been found guilty of anything. There is no evidence of any wrongdoing. Sure. Um, but there were, I think everyone now recognizes an error of judgment in defending the Salazar uh, yeah. situation. And I mean, I have written on Run, Blog, Run that I thought that it was harsh to fire Neil Black, who sadly died uh, subsequently. But I think that once Neil Black, who was performance director, had gone, it's pretty hard for the head of endurance to remain in his position. And yeah. so, so he has gone. There was also a television program uh, which showed evidence of Fudge being involved in Mo Farah getting um, L carnitine injections before a London marathon. Okay. And uh, that, in fact, Fudge had been the person who had gone to Switzerland to get the supplement. Mm -hmm. Now, again, this was um, not illegal, but as somebody put it, it was perhaps not within the spirit of the sport. Okay. And um, when I did the interview with Joe Coates, the CEO at British Athletics, and asked a question about Salazar, she answered it, but then added, but of course, I wasn't there at the time. Yeah. And in a sense, the fact that Neil Black is no longer there, Barry Fudge is no longer there, arguably makes it easier for Joe Coates as a new CEO to say, look, we have cleaned out the stables, and this is a fresh start. Uh, Salazar mistakes were made, but the people who made those mistakes are no longer there, so we've drawn a line under it. Yeah. Because I think as long as Barry Fudge stayed, there were going to be questions asked about what he had done and what he knew and all of that. So mm -hmm. I, I think it's sad for him. I think he was a good man. I think our performance in terms of medals over the last 10 years in endurance events is a credit to him. But probably it was inevitable that he would go and it certainly helps Joe Coates to have a fresh start. Okay, okay. Um, is there anybody else from that era still within UK athletics? Not in a senior position. Okay. Uh, uh, well, I mean, you, you, there, there are people like Peter Stanley who deals with jumps and throws, Stephen Maguire who, mm -hmm. who is the, the sprints and relays, but, but no, nobody at a senior level who would have had associations with okay. Salazar and so on. Okay, okay. Um, had you ever spoken to Barry Fudge? I didn't know him. I'd, I mean, I'd spoken to him occasionally, but I, I, I'd never had a long one-to-one -one conversation with him, so I didn't really, really know him. Yeah, they. Uh, I pulled up an article on uh, the Daily Mail hmm. from during the World Champs in '17 that they had uh, uh, that Mo and um, Barry Fudge had had a falling out, hmm. and uh, I think that's when. Paul Radcliffe's husband, Gary uh, Muff, yeah. came in mm -hmm. as the coach. Um, I got a note last night that you would find humorous. It was one of the most bizarre press releases that I have seen. USA Track and Field, the governing body in the U.S., is discussing out loud the possibility of putting on an end of the season meet like a u.s open or a championship they expect at the end of september perhaps early october they have no idea what state it's going to be in depending on the covid stuff and they don't know if it's actually going to be able to happen because of covid hmm. now i'm not one to give advice to the federation but my suggestion is why do they even tell us about this thing? Because it makes no sense. 
um, they're really, right now we've just had the pre and the Harris meet canceled. Um, I'm not sure if any Diamond League stuff after what we've had so far are even going to happen. Maybe Stockholm. Well, um, Lausanne is going to happen, but okay. it's only pole vault. Okay. They're doing men's and women's pole vault, and you can understand that the, that's manageable to do sure. uh, to do uh, one discipline for men and women. You, you, I believe, are having something like twelve athletes in each, so you only have the the costs of uh, flights for twenty four athletes, sure. uh, and you can cover that with sponsorship and television. I, I believe that something is happening in Zurich. Yeah, um, and I've heard that at Monaco they're planning to have races with three athletes per race. Wow! So that you can spread them out over the over the eight lanes. Okay, okay. But I mean, to what to what extent that constitutes being a diamond league? I, I, yeah. I don't know. And you know, you, can you, you go to any of the, Can you go to any of those two or not? Um. I need to tell you that I am old. Now mm -hmm. I didn't know I was old, but no, my know. government, my government has told me that I'm gold. Okay. Uh, um, and I, I'm in the vulnerable category, okay. and so I probably would not travel to anything this year. Okay. 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 Yeah, it's going to be kind of a uh, yeah. I'm, I'm not sure I'm going anywhere because I'm a U.S. citizen and. Um, we're not real popular right now, apparently. I had something to do. There's a guy in the White House, I think, who irritates a few people. Okay. Um, well, actually, I mean, if we can get you into England, I'd be delighted to have you, except, of course, you'd have to quarantine for two weeks as soon as you arrive before yes. you do anything. Yes. And and then, this is part of the issue for, for me. If I were to travel um, anywhere, uh, it would be against my government's advice. And then when I return, I would have to quarantine for two weeks. Wow. So it doesn't really give you a lot of, a, a lot of incentive to travel. That's true. That's and true. the significance of being against government advice is that you would not be able to get any kind of um, health or travel insurance. That's yeah. That's kind of special too. That makes uh, makes yeah. us feel even because because most insurance policies have uh, you know if you're traveling against your government's advice, then it's invalid. Yeah, yeah. That so, will make it very special. Um, so last week, the New York City Marathon canceled. Yeah. And then within an hour or two, Berlin canceled. Yeah. Um, uh, and you and I have been. We have our weekly London watch, mm. and we've been wondering out loud about London. And then I get this strange press release on Hamburg that the German government has said they can have 14,000 people, 4,000 marathoners and 10,000 half marathoners, mm. run through the streets of Hamburg on September 14th. And then Jeff Whiteman, the well-known uh, commentator in the UK, who is also the coach of his son, Jake, a fine, uh, can I say British miler, even though he's Scottish? Absolutely. Okay, I just want to make sure I didn't want, you know, Ian Stewart to, you know, kick my butt again. Um, well, I, I, I'm in England, and basically Scots are British if they do well, and they're Scottish if they do badly. Okay, okay, all right, that's good. Okay, I, I like that one. Um, let's see. Um, Yes, so I, I, I this Hamburg thing uh, kind of came out of the blue. And then Jeff uh, Whiteman wrote a note that, gosh, maybe London can still happen. And then Jos Hermans, the manager of Global Athletics, former record holder in the hour run and a European silver medalist or bronze medalist. He's a medalist, I think, in the, the 5,000. Maybe. Um, so anyway, uh, he he claims that London and another marathon are London and Hamburg are going to happen, and I'm going. You know what parallel universe? And I love Yos, but mm. do you think we're going to see a fall marathon? 
I I can't see London happening. Okay. Um, because of, for the reasons we've said before, that London is so much more than an elite race. Yeah. And I think it would lose so much. Um, the one development here is that we are going to have the uh, British Championships in Tell September. Tell me about that, Stuart. Uh, well, it, it's happening in September, but mm -hmm. without any spectators. Okay. Um, it's going to be on television, and that, uh, that makes it economically viable. Right. Uh, it's, go it's going to be in Manchester because okay. the Birmingham Stadium is being renovated for the Commonwealth Games. So it's yeah. a relatively small stadium, so therefore they weren't going to get that many spectators anyway. Mm -hmm. So the income, not that great. But again, you see, I think the question I would have is if you are a British athlete and it, it's the beginning of September and you haven't competed anywhere else, are you really going to go and do a British Championship? Yes. Um, because, I mean, some athletes are saying to me, uh, well, it's an Olympic year next year, we hope. So if we're not going to compete, let's shut down, have a good rest, and then start winter training perhaps a little bit earlier. Okay. okay. So again, whether people will, will want to, how many people will want to compete, when it, it's, it's trial for nothing. And certainly when the world indoor got cancelled, all the top athletes dropped out of our indoor trials and I think it was a bit the same in the States. Yes. So I wouldn't expect, uh, if you were thinking of coming over to, to the British trials to see Laura Muir running uh, and uh, Dan, Dina Asher Smith running, it could well be uh, a wasted journey because I think it'd be questionable how many of our top athletes will actually turn up to do it. Okay, okay. that's a good point. Um, let's see now. Okay, we kind of talked about Chance of London. Um, U.S. citizens, no travel in Europe, uh, and everybody else. Now, if you go to Europe, Stuart, do you have to quarantine as a uh, British citizen? Um, as of now, yes. There's rumors that this week the government is going to introduce some reciprocal deals with certain countries so that okay. they can come to us and we can come to them without quarantining. Yeah. Uh, and the reason for this is that um, we're in danger of losing our entire um, uh, air industry because no one is flying yeah. and so much of Europe depends on, on tourism. So. Yeah. Uh, they're trying to do deals which will encourage people to go on vacation uh, right. so that the airlines get some passengers. Mm -hmm. But uh, details have not yet been announced, but it is thought it will involve certain countries in Europe, but not others, depending on the state of COVID in each country by country. Wow. Wow. Yeah, that's going to be pretty interesting. But but um, again, if you're going to fly, you have to go through a busy airport. Yeah. Uh, and even, you know, even though you're taking precautions, then you get an airplane where unless they are going to restrict greatly the number of passengers, you're going to be sitting quite close to people. Then you yeah. go through another airport. Um, uh, and then you go and sit on a crowded beach with people. So it's, if COVID's around, it, it seems to be a, a, quite a risky business. What is the perception of the whole COVID pandemic in the UK right now? In the US, there's people who think it's a move to shove vaccines down everybody's throats. Some people think it's alien uh, related. Uh, some people think, and I mean people from other planets, um, some people just think it's a, a fabrication. Do you have that? Kind I, of don't th I don't think we have any of that. I mean, 42,000 people have died. Yeah. Uh, I think you might get a certain criticism of, of how well the government has managed it. Mm -hmm. um, there's a view that the government has been too slow at each stage of the process. Uh, but I think we take it pretty seriously. There is, there is a real concern that uh, up until now, restaurants are all closed and bars are closed, they're going to open 
uh, from next week. But okay. a, a con there's a real concern as to how many of those will actually open and survive. Uh, yeah. I mentioned the the uh, air um, the air, all the air companies uh, which yeah. which are in trouble. And I mean, the government in some ways has done brilliantly in with its furlough scheme of of, of helping employers to lay off staff. But mm -hmm. the current debt now is more than our economy is worth. So wow. the government's debt will be paid off over a number of years. And I mean, one of the implications for the, of that is uh, that our government has been very generous in terms of funding sport. But will that amount of money be available in the next few years? And I think there's a real question about that. Yeah, yeah. Do you see interest in track and field going up or down in the UK during the pandemic? Uh, it, it's hard to say, really, because um, because it hasn't. Most sports have not yet come back. Premier League soccer has been back for two weeks, in uh, with no spectators. So the games are are a lot of games on on, on TV. Um, I mean, I think that there's a lot I read on social media about park runners being frustrated that they that they cannot do their recreational running. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, the government has been criticized for uh, saying that obesity is a problem, um, but they're opening McDonald's and the, the bars and not opening the gyms and the swimming pools. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. That's a good point. Um, so Sebco got the uh, person of, Athletic Person of the Week Award from the website Athletics Illustrated out of uh, New Zealand. It's a, it's a fun website. They do a really nice job. And they gave it to uh, Seb because of his comments about Mr. Coleman. And essentially what he said was that even the world record holder at 60 and the world champion at 100 meters, Christian Coleman, has to show up for his whereabouts test. And then if he was had been such a person who had missed one or two tests, he'd be sitting at the door on the steps waiting for the testers to show up. I thought that that was wonderful. I thought that that was articulate. I thought that Seb showed enough frustration, but also enough um, of the leadership that look, we have testing for a reason. You've got to do it. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I think that basically Sepp was saying the rules, uh, Christian, I have some news for you. The rules apply to you as well as to everyone else. Mm -hmm. But um, I think it's really interesting that athletes are very unsympathetic to other athletes yeah. who, who, who miss tests. Yeah. And I mean, athletes, uh, so many athletes have been caught on social media saying, look, um, my obligation as an athlete to make myself available an hour a day to be tested. And th that's the end of it. You know, that's my part of keeping the, the, the sport clean. Well, Ellie Doyle, who you and I both know, fine Scottish athlete. Yes. Um, she related on Twitter last week that she had even put down around the three days she was expecting her baby yes where she would be and she i think she had the baby early mm -hmm. and she sent a note off to make sure they knew where she would be that day yeah and yeah. uh is it Di? is that how you pronounce his name Di green the yes four meter hurdler he's the european champion yes. um boy he got he was pretty upset and you know what i thought he did a nice job of communicating it it's mm -hmm. like look you're not supposed to get – so what Christian Coleman said was, well, no one called me, and I was just doing some shopping. I was five minutes away. Mm -hmm. So he's trying to lay the blame on everybody else. And the truth was yeah. he was supposed to be at his this one place for an hour yeah. or you update what you're doing. Yeah. And it was pretty simple. Um, he's not getting much sympathy in the U.S. He's getting no sympathy in Europe. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think he's going to get two years. 
Yes. And, and well, I mean, important, I, I mean, I, I felt re really sorry for um, uh, Brianna McNeil, who missed the test when she was invited to the White House yes. uh, to celebrate getting her gold medal in Rio. But yes. any athlete I spoke to had no sympathy at all. Wow. Said, you know, she should she should have updated her her uh, whereabouts. I mean, that would have been almost as good as uh, Ailey Doyle having the the testers coming into the delivery suite. Mm -hmm. If the if the the testers had knocked on the door of the White House and said, "We've come to test uh, some of your athletes." Yeah, that that would have been a great story. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Um, any other news from across the pond for this week? Anything that you want to to bring up? No, it's. I mean, it's all. It's all very quiet. Um, I spoke to an athlete today who'd been to been to the track and was really excited about this. She hadn't seen that one for a while, <laughs> um, and uh, she said that it was. It, it all worked. Uh, they were only allowed ninety minutes, uh, and they had to observe the social distancing and uh, run in one direction and all things like that. But. Uh, they they'd got to track that was in Loughborough. Okay, okay, yeah. The um, your I have your Kendall Ellis interview part one. I'll be getting up this afternoon, and also your book uh, review, um, and we'll get those out to people. Mm. And thank you for those. You're doing a book review about once a week, and you do several reviews on one book report. And um, you've got about thirty five books that you've reviewed. So yeah. Uh, you're, you're... Just one one other thing you'll be putting up later was um, I, the uh, Dina Isher Smith does a column in the Daily Telegraph from time okay. to time, and and she did this piece uh, which I've summarised for you, uh, in which she sort of posed the question: um, Does racism ever affect me? Only every day. Wow. And she told stories of things like you go into an expensive department store and uh, asked to try on something. And she's routinely asked, this is expensive. Are you sure you can afford it? Um, and, you know, getting into an elevator and someone gets out just because, because uh, a colored person, a person wow. of color, it in the elevator, and I mean, I I just was qu quite horrified at this. You know, speaking as somebody who has been around in our society for a long time, to think that we have allowed a society to be created in which yeah. someone as successful and clever uh, and articulate as Dina finds herself embarrassed uh, so many times. I recall about, this is 1993, I was coaching at Foothill College in Los Altos, a very wealthy, lily white area. And my track team was mostly African American and Latino. And um, I took, uh, my head coach, Joe Mangan, and I took a group of 12 kids down to Santa Barbara to the city college meet there. And my relay kids, good group of kids, a little tough. They were walking around this meet, and they realized pretty quick that they were pretty much the only African-American kids at the meet. Hmm. And the next thing they noticed, so they were a little amused. Next thing they noticed is the security guards were following them around everywhere. Hmm. And they came up to me, the security guard came up to me, and I asked the security cards what they were doing. They said, well, these kids looked a little tough and we just uh, had a, you know, we had to check them out. And I said, well, I think you're following them because they're black. And they denied it. And my kids got really, really upset. And they said, coach, they're following us because we're black. And I said, yes, they are. And what are you going to do? And they said, we're going to win the relay. And they won the relay. And I wrote a letter to the president of the college, and he apologized. Um, and I just said I used it; I had to use it as a learning experience, but I was terribly embarrassed. 
but um, it's it's true, you know, and it's terribly true in the U.S. Yeah. Um, for you. I mean, for, Dina also said that if she got into a store, on occasion security have followed her around. Yeah, yeah. It's just it's amazing. See, and, and you know, I was under this mistaken impression that that didn't exist in the UK. You know, when I um, when I first started spending time in the UK, I would go to Birmingham and I developed a friendship with Ian Stewart. And so we would go to Indian food and one of the, you know, Ian's very proud of Birmingham. And he would tell me, he said, you know, everybody speaks the King's English and people get along great and they seem to. I love seeing like people from India, people from Kenya and everything speaking King's English. It just was really kind of a kick for me. And I like Birmingham and the curry is wonderful. And uh, so I, I thought everybody got along. And I was there in 2011. I was in London in 2011 during the riots when all that stuff happened. It just totally blew my mind. Mm. And I'm going, God, this is everywhere, you know? Mm. It's not just the United States. Um, and it's uh, over here, I think we're finally having a reckoning with it. And it's fascinating to me, according to the surveys and things, that so many Americans are supporting the taking down of Confederate statues, the taking down mm -hmm. of statues of racist. Um, the support of Black Lives Matter is amazing. Yes. Um, but there's also a lot of vitriol on the Republican side, uh, which is unfortunate because the Republican Party wasn't always that way. And, and conservative wasn't a bad word over here. You know, I, I remember guys like William Buckley and uh, a, a liberal feminist named Jermaine Greer on American public television in the 1970s, three hour argument and no one raised their voice and they, they quoted and they, they discussed things and it was a learning experience. And in the US, we can't do that. I mean, that's why I love watching BBC. You guys don't uh, interrupt people most of the time <laughs> when they have discussions, you know? Mm. And uh, I wish that would be a little bit more in the U.S., but we're getting down to our last 50 seconds, Stuart. And as always, I enjoy this uh, 40 minutes with you each week, my friend. I miss seeing you at track meets, yeah. especially at the uh, press conferences. They're always pretty colorful and delightful in uh, the U.K. I just remember uh, our long jumper, uh, Greg Rutherford, yep. him and um, Valerie. Uh, Adams. Yes. Uh, they're hyster they were hysterical. I've got a couple of tapes of them, and they were such a hoot. They would have so much fun. Yeah. And even David Rudisha would get in on it. Mm. He would kind of chuckle a little bit. Mm -hmm. But um, the interviews that British Athletics helped us do were really, really good and fun good. and helped beat up to the meat. So I hope to be able to do that with you again next year in 2021, Indeed. my friend. Indeed, let's okay. hope so. So until next week, um, a fond farewell, and uh, I will be posting your stories. Good. Enjoy your evening. I hope it gets a little warmer over there. Thank you. Okay. Right, cheers. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Goodbye, friends of Run, Blog, Run. This is Larry Eater, and we are with Stuart Weir, and we are solving all the world's problems in athletics. Well, hello, sports fans. It's Larry Eater with Run Blog Run. This is Athletics Chat. I believe it's number um, VII, so number seven. Um, and uh, Stuart and I chatted today, the 29th of June, 2020. Stuart's in Oxford, England, and I'm in San Jose, California. You can hear all the chimes my mother collected over 44 years on our lovely little porch and the little water fountain, the babbling brook in the background. I haven't seen my uh, hummingbirds yet today, but they'll be here soon. And I hope you guys are having a great Monday. I had a lot of fun yesterday. I did a socially distanced drive with my girlfriend from San Jose down to Cambria, California, right outside of San Luis Obispo on Highway 1, which is like up and down and up and down. And pretty cool. There's a couple drivers who 
probably shouldn't have been on the road. And if I'm president of the United States, I would have had them removed surgically from the highway, but that's a whole different story. Uh, did see some seals and some amazing coastline. And uh, if you ever get a chance to do it, my dream is to, uh, back in the 70s, I had a Volkswagen bus, 1969 gold VW bus. And I would tool around California with it, pretending that I was a little hippie and doing my training, going to races and stuff and listening to you know, Loggins in Messina and Boston and all that jazz. Uh, anyway, uh, it caught on fire about 1980. So I've been in mourning. I did have a funeral for it, just so you know. And um, the issue is that um, I'm going to find a rebuilt one and uh, tool around the, the states and go to itty bitty little track meets and national parks and KOA campgrounds and meet America, you know, like uh, what the Tocqueville did in the, what do you do that in 1798 or something? Toured America. So I'll do my tour of America. Anyway, uh, I've digressed. That happens sometimes. So today we talked about Dick Berkeley, the uh, 1976 and 1980 Olympic 5,000 meter runner. Uh, he was also the world record holder on January 13th, 1978, ran 354.9 in Towson, Maryland, just barely made the meet, uh, a lot of snow in Buffalo. Um, good guy. He also said that uh, when he beat uh, Steve Prefontaine in uh, 1974 over two miles indoors, he was asked what he thought about during races, and he said sex in this race is, is one long orgasm. It was one of my favorite quotes, and I think it's the first time I ever saw orgasm, and the only time I ever saw it in the pages of Track and Field News. So you have to have to give them kudos uh, for a Catholic boy. That was a big deal. Uh, so Dick Berkeley, R.I.P. You're a good man, and uh, we'll keep you in our thoughts and our prayers with you and your family and your friends. Barry Fudge, who uh, from 2013 was the performance director at UK Athletics, uh, is no longer there. Uh, he's probably, after Neil Black, Black was let go, uh, Barry Fudge uh, was really the only person from that era. And uh, we feel that uh, it was a response to the times that they, had, uh, they protected, UK Athletics protected and supported Alberto Salazar. And their Joe Coates, the, the new CEO, is really trying to do a clean slate, and she doesn't need to give media any more ammunition. Um, then there's the USATF mystery meet, uh, not mystery meet, M-E-A-T, a mystery track meet. Uh, they're trying to do something, but the truth is they don't know what they can do. What's going to happen with COVID? I mean, right now, I think California's on the cusp of being uh, re-locked down again because the numbers are up so high. People aren't wearing masks, you know, uh, although I see a lot of them out there. There's still too close and, and too dangerous. And um, the issue is that um, uh, they won't know for a while yet. So we don't know what state it's going to be in. We hope it's in September. I'm looking forward to a track beat. I just don't know what they can do. And I admire them for giving it a shot. I just want everybody to be careful. The pre and the Paris Diamond Leagues were canceled. Prefontaine, I think I've missed twice since 1990. Uh, Paris, I've been going to for a few years. Love that meet. And the Sade Charlotte. Also liked it in the stadium uh, in Saint-Denis. But uh, alas, it's not going to happen this year. Uh, French Federation's doing pretty well, about 895,000 euros in their coffers. So they're doing, they got a pretty good amount of cash there. Um, U.S. citizens, no travel in Europe. So even if I wanted to go to Europe, uh, to um, even if I wanted to go to Europe, I could not go because U.S. citizens aren't allowed to travel after midnight tonight. So thank you, President Trump. Thank you, Trump administration. Um, I don't think anybody thought it was going to be as rough as it is, but you guys have had advisors. And it uh, doesn't matter whether I vote for the person or not, government's supposed to take care of people. 
and there's some issues there. Berlin, New York City Marathons, canceled. Uh, Berlin, you pretty much do because the city of Berlin said no more than 5,000 people in one place at one time. And you have 42,000 for the roller derby, rollerblade thing. And uh, you had about 40,000 for the marathon. So that's not happening. And they tried every way they could. And then New York, New York's the biggest marathon in the world, 53,000. Love New York City Marathon. I think I've been to, I think I've missed three maybe since 1986. Uh, great race. Used to love watching Fred LeBeau prognosticate and Alan smile in the background and have to figure out what was going to work and what wasn't. Fred would just kind of like throw things out there and, and uh, Alan would catch him and decide, yeah, I think maybe we could do this one. Or good try, Fred, you know. But uh, it was a glorious time. It was a golden time uh, in sport. And uh, the marathons were fun. Getting to run that race in 1986 was really a trip. I think the bridge really does shake, you know, it felt like. Anyway, um, we're going to miss those events. Uh, Hamburg is still on. I, I don't understand it at all. But maybe it'll happen. Uh, which means that could London happen? Who knows? Jos Hermans, uh, the manager of uh, Global uh, Sports Communications over in Holland. Um, he has a tremendous number of fantastic athletes. Elliot Kipchoge and uh, Kenisa Bekele, the two the top two big guys right now. Um, he thinks that those races are going to happen. And he's an optimist. I, you know, I enjoy Jos, and we need people like Jos. Uh, He's the character, but I don't know if it will be. I beg to differ right now. So, and then Sebco. Sebco, a tip of the hat to Sebco for standing up for his sport once again. This is what happened this time. Christian Coleman, world indoor champion in 2018, world outdoor champion in 2019. Almost missed 2019 for whereabouts test. Well, he's going to be watching some track meets from TV, it looks like, for a while because he's missed too many tests and the most recent one instead of sitting on his doorstep waiting patiently and lovingly for the drug testers he went shopping for an hour why that hour why not wait and what i want to know is why his management didn't take control of it and say christian you're gonna lose a half million seven hundred thousand bucks whatever you're being paid by the sponsors because you got to run to get paid. It's just silliness. Anyway, whereabouts test shouldn't be missed. People screw up once, twice, but three times and four times? Come on. Ms. El Nassar has got the same thing going. Um, anyway, it's just disappointing. And Seb said, look, there's no room for a deal, and you better be there. Good job, Seb. Don't get to tell you that all the time, but uh, tip of the hat. And our friends at Athletics Illustrated, Made you person of the week. So we'll make you a global person of the week. You're a run blog run person of the week too. Good job, Seb. Keep it up. Defend the sport. If that's what your job is. And, you know, look for ways for people to compete. I really did enjoy the impossible games. I thought it was a great shot. And uh, I think Maury Plant would have been happy and Sven Arne as well. Um, we've got a lot of good people in the sport. And I, th I really believe that within the sport are the answers to our challenges right now. COVID-19 is going to be around for a while. I think we're going to be dealing with it till 2023. Yeah, just take a deep breath and you're going to have time to have to wear a mask. You better wash your hands and better be careful. Talk to you soon.